there's a stigma around making money. You do want to make a lot of money too, right? Watch all these other people jump in. It's not about the money. It's not about the money. And I'm like, you're an idiot. It's all about the money. The helping people part is a given. Question is, am I legit? I got a million dollar home, spent over a million dollars on a weekend home. What do you do? I'm a personal trader. And just to get the reaction out of them, well, Jaguar XKR 100, only one of 25 made. I bought that new in 2002. It was the Hummer H2, brand new. $70,000 for that. And you have a Tesla man now, aren't you? I have two Teslas. No, there's nothing legitimate about me. Nothing. Listen, Lawrence, this is a real thing. Some people are afraid of success and mm. really need to coach through it. And they set up their own roadblock. Like, you know, when that kind of money comes in, it freaks them out. So, you know, I help these guys. Welcome to another episode brought to you by Imagine Strength, the future of safe, simple, and effective high-intensity training equipment. Are you a hit studio owner looking for equipment that's not just top-notch, but also tailored to your specific needs? Imagine Strength is your answer. Inspired by the legendary Arthur Jones, Imagine Strength is revolutionizing the hit industry with their state-of-the-art yet affordable equipment. Their team doesn't just sell hit equipment, they live and breathe it. I've personally experienced their gear at the Resistance Exercise Conference, and let me tell you, it was an intense workout that I won't soon forget, in the best way possible, of course. So why choose Imagine Strength? Number one, they provide customized solutions for HIT Studios. Number two, they have budget-friendly yet high-performance designs. And number three, they're committed to innovation and excellence in high-intensity training specifically. Founder Jeff Turner and his dedicated team are on a mission to make HIT accessible to everyone. Getting started is easy. Number one, visit imaginestrength.com. Number two, consult with their expert team. And number three, choose the equipment that will skyrocket your business. Don't wait. Head over to imaginestrength.com and elevate your hit studio today with Imagine Strength. Lawrence Neal here, and welcome back to High Intensity Business, your one-stop shop for elevating your hit business and fueling your passion for high-intensity training. This is episode 450. Today's guest is Pete Serqua again. Pete is a master high-intensity fitness coach and creator of the 90-second fitness solution. He has been professionally coaching since 1985, and is also a five-time best-selling author for Simon & Schuster and Styles Publishing, which include the books High Intensity Fitness Revolution for Women, and High Intensity Fitness Revolution for Men. His pro coaching program shows personal trainers and hit business owners how to earn seven figures per year. You can find out more about all of that over at highintensitybusiness.com forward slash coaching and also be linked in the description wherever you're consuming this. So today is going to be a fun podcast because we are going to answer a question that a few people have had. So I guess Pete, in a way, kind of popped out of nowhere. And there's a specific reason for that. Um, and so I've had a few questions of people who are skeptical, people who don't think Pete's legit or they've never heard of him before. You know, I was really skeptical. I think I've been public about that because I hadn't heard of you either. And I'd spoken to a couple of trusted colleagues who spoke very highly of you. And then obviously the rest is history. Um, obviously, we have a relationship now, Pete. We've spoken a ton. We're working together. We've partnered together. Um, so I can be incredibly biased. People are going to be like, but Lawrence, you're, how is this podcast going to um, be valuable if you're so biased? So I'm going to attempt to be as harsh and play yeah, as challenging and play devil's advocate as best I can. And I've got a lot of great questions, which are really taken from people who have got concerns. Um, and so, yeah, I'm uh, <laughs> Pete's just smiling and laughing because he's like, bring it on. Um, but yeah, let's, let's get into this. And the, so the question, the topic is, is Pete Serkla a legit, legitly successful hit business owner? So Pete, I don't know where we start, but I figured, uh, maybe we could do this chronologically and you could just walk us through your story. And as you do, I can then ask questions. I think that's probably the best way to do this. So and then we want to start, maybe start when you, when you perhaps were training just before opening a studio and the transition there, and then we can get past go from there. Sure. So uh, the question is, am I legit? The answer is no, there's nothing legitimate about me. Nothing. I don't know why the heck you have me on your podcast. I'm, I'm surprised they haven't tanked yet. Uh, <laughs> people who are coaching with me, I don't know what they're thinking. It's just absolutely amazing. Uh, so, you know, um, 
no, I'm not legit. Um, I've been doing this. My wife and I were just talking this morning, but she says, you're going to go on and talk to Lawrence Sinanis. I am. And she said, um, she goes, exactly how many years are you professional at this point? And I said, well, I professionally, I was accepting money for training in 1986. So 20, 2026 will be my 40th year. So I'm 38 years into it as of this January. Um, big deal. I'm 60 years old. Uh, and that was in 1986. I opened up my first gym. I called it South Shore Muscle and Fitness. It was a regular gym that was one of the first ones that welcomed women. Uh, it was inviting. It was um, a nice, a different atmosphere from a regular dungeon gym. And it was down in South New Jersey, uh, one mile from the beach. So we had a great summer crowd and uh, it was a little slower in the winter. And it was, it was my first gym experience, gym owning experience. It was a massive struggle. Um, to say it was successful uh, would mean that I was barely paying the bills. Like if I was able to pay my bills uh, on the first of the month, I classify that as a success. There was never more than $5 left over for me. Like there was no and partying. I drove a car that was in a complete embarrassment and I just needed it. Um, but yeah, so that was my first experience. Now, prior to that, I'm bodybuilding and powerlifting and I'm, you know, doing all that kind of stuff. So I've got plenty of, uh, I opened up that gym with 19 inch arms and a, you know, 50 something inch chest and a 500 pound bench press. By the way, those are not marketable skills. They don't make you any money. I found out the hard way. So that's how I started, Lawrence. Yeah, great. And uh, I should also say, obviously the, well, Pete hasn't seen any of these questions. So I headed this box. I said, look, do you want me to send you them just so that you're, you don't get completely flustered? Not that Pete ever gets flustered. Um, and he was like, no, just surprise me. <laughs> you know, my, Doug McGuff does that as well. I love that. I love that. I don't have to share anything. I can just, you know, throw, throw any sort of curveball at you. Um, all right. So now I, we, I think you've certainly told me that story before. So I know some of that. Um, so what happened next? Uh, I, I, a friend of mine came down from New York city and, uh, to train, you know, you know, summer, it was a, a very hot summer vacation, hot being a popular summer vacation spot where I was and, uh, came in to work out for the summer. And back then, if you were, uh, I was charging $25 a month for a gym membership. Again, this is 1986. And, uh, a friend came down from New York city and said, walked into the gym and said, Hey, I heard about you and your gym and would you train me? Yeah, absolutely. No problem. You know, I'm an amateur bodybuilder and power lifter and my resume was good enough to attract people who wanted to go to the next level. So I started training this guy all summer long. He was there for like two and a half months, uh, June, July, and a little bit of August and, uh, charged him the $25 a month. And I was training him three to four times a week. You know, we're doing bodybuilding workouts. Um, and uh, at the end, in August, he says, hey, I'm, I'm heading back up to New York and I just want to say thank you for all the training. How much do I owe you? <laughs> and I said, you paid the $25 a month membership. As a matter of fact, you paid for the month of August and you're only using half of it. And I appreciate that. But no, you, you're, you're paid up. Because, you know, there's personal trainers in New York City that actually like, you know, get paid by the hour for this. And I'll, really? I had no idea. I didn't know anybody was getting a fee for training. I thought you had to own the gym and that was it. So he said, yeah, come up to New York City for a weekend as my guest. Me and my friends will take you out. We'll go to some nightclubs and restaurants, but you can go to the gyms during the day. And, and uh, I said, yeah, I will. So I did. I took a weekend. I went up there on a Friday. And how far is that to drive? Is that a couple of hours, New Jersey to New York? It's in New Jersey, New York are connected, but I was down in Southern New Jersey. So, so it was definitely a couple hours, probably two and a half hours to get up there. Um, okay. not, not a bad drive at all. And anybody who knows the United States and the East coast knows I took the garden state parkway right up to the, the tunnel and that was in. So, um, I went up there and it was really funny, you know, a 250 pound bodybuilder. I've got a tiny waist and shoulders out to here and stupid looking arms. I mean, I really look ridiculous. <laughs> My father used to tell me that when I did this, my arm was bigger than my head, which looked really funny. Can you get us some old photos? 
I do have old photos. I do have old photos of 250 and, and, and abs. So, um, really? up to my, it, it really looks so it, it's, anyway, I go up there, my friends, true to their word, took me out, showed me around the city a little bit, even though I was born there, I, I wasn't really familiar with Manhattan and, and the workings of it. So I walked into a gym, you know, put my arms up on the desk and asked the young lady back there. I'm interested in personal training. You know, can, can, can you tell me about your program? Yeah, here's our rates and policies card. You pick a trainer. And, and, and can I meet some of the trainers? Sure, here's this guy. Here's this girl. Here's the, you know. And I'm like, holy cow, these guys are getting $50 an hour. They don't even look like they work out. They're definitely not built or as strong as I am. I'm like, oh my God. I went back to South Jersey. I sold my gym to the tanning salon next door. Um, and a few months later, I'm up in New York City. This is now not 1988. I walked in there and I'm going to do this. This was it. This was the light bulb. I mean, the light bulb moment. I'm going to get paid by the hour for giving workouts, which was my dream. This is what I wanted to do. So in uh, 1988, 1990, I am in New York City. And uh, I met Lou Lovato. Uh, who now owns the Ultimate Training Center on 54th Street, Madison Avenue. Um, I met him at a gym called Prescriptive Fitness, which was a gym that allowed personal trainers to set up shop and train their clients. The gym was partly owned by Dana Carvey, who's uh, an actor and comedian that most people have heard of and, and know of. Very popular with uh, Saturday Night Live back then in the, in the early 90s. Um, he was partnered with a chiropractor, I believe. I believe that's what the guy did upstairs. So they had the chiropractor's office. He was friendly with this guy. They invested in the gym and they opened up prescriptive fitness. Uh, celebrities, I mean, if you just if you just sneeze, you you you, you got you know a, a, a blessing from at least two or three celebrities all over the place. Plus, there's plenty of regular people. Lou was training his clients in there. Um, he was doing. Uh, not only did Lou looked like Mike Menser. I mean, visually, like he was built like Mike Menser. He had the same shoulder to waist ratio. He had the same mustache. Um, the only difference between Lou and Mike Menser was Lou had a ponytail, which he had for years. It looked really good on him. It was a great look. But um, I mean, and he actually used to wear a heavy duty t-shirt, um, which fit him perfectly. And, you know, from across the gym, I watched him walk in there and, uh, one day and he strapped a uh, hundred pound, I'm pretty sure it was a hundred pound dumbbell to his waist and got up and did a set of dips um, to failure. And he, I, I, he had a training partner with him, not a trainer, but a training partner. And this guy was, you know, working him through the set. And then, you know, afterwards I walked up to him and introduced myself and I said, hey, you're doing Menser's workouts. And, uh, you know, we struck up a conversation. And if you see Lou from a distance, you think you don't want to approach this guy because he's, he looks like he's, he looks like a badass because he is a badass and you really, he doesn't look approachable. Right. But then as soon as you talk to him, he's the nicest guy in the world. Um, and we, you know, hit it off right away. And he, he said, you, you know, you should hire me as your trainer. We can, we can work on some of this stuff. And I did, he was my trainer for a while. And you know, there were certain things I wanted to work on and, he would kill me in a workout. We were doing, we were doing 100% Menser. Um, and uh, that relationship, one day I got a phone call from him. He had a partner, I believe. Uh, I, I don't know the guy's name or anything about him. Never met him. But he and another guy signed a, or were about to sign a lease for private gym space. He wanted a couple of blocks away. He wanted to open up his own private studio. He was going to call it Ultimate Training Center. And I got a phone call. Hey, Pete, you interested in doing some training? You know, I'm actually about to sign a lease and my partner backed out. Um, and I, I, I dropped when I was literally dropped what I was doing. I jumped in a cab. I went up to his location and the equipment was in there. He had dumbbells up to, this is no joke. He'll tell you. He had dumbbells up to 150 pounds each. <laughs> That's like, Lou, what are we doing with those? You and I can't lift them. Like, like you know, this is for personal training. Like, what client's going to use this? Well, just in case we train bodybuilders. I'm like, oh, okay. All right. So 
I, I think you originally wanted to tap into the bodybuilding market, you know, like Doreen Yates and, and do high intensity for, for that level of client. And I, I just told him, I'm like, well, my, my clientele is a lot different. You know, I'm, I'm trying to strengthen uh, baby boomers, you know, people who don't want to work out. Um, and we, we started working together. We worked together five years there and we developed, um, you know, our marketing, uh, our protocols. Uh, we went down together. We went down to Florida to meet Ken Hutchins and do the super slow certification. Um, he was there with me. So it was, that's, that's how it all started until my light bulb went off again. And I'm like, oh, this is how this needs to be done to, I wanted the money plain and simple. I, I didn't want to be, the average trainer was getting $50 an hour. Uh, Lou at the time was charging $25 a session, but his sessions were high intensity. They never went really more than 30 minutes. Right. Uh, I remember a workout that, uh, I'm, I'm digressing a bit, but a You're workout okay. he gave me, um, chest and shoulders. I did a set of dumbbell flies. This is in a gym, gym setting. We didn't have any Nautilus equipment, but we had a regular gym equipment, but a set of Nautilus flies to a set of decline bench press, which was a really good lift for me. Uh, so, um, that was it. You know, he had me do it. He'd stay, go ahead, Pete, warm up with whatever you want to warm up with. And then boom, working sets, dumbbell flies. And then he dragged me over to the decline bench, which was already loaded up, uh, in a crowded gym. It's funny how Lou could load up a machine, right? A bar, a barbell and walk away from it. And nobody would go try to do it or unload it. You know, it's a crowded gym, right? Nobody would go near it. So he's <laughs> an intimidating guy. You know, he's still, he's still pretty, you know, even though we're both over 60, he's still a jack guy. So, uh, yeah, he dragged me over there. We do a set of declines. Okay. Another big exercise for him. He'd have me on an, in, an incline bench. He would put the incline bench pretty much all the way up. Maybe it's just a slight, slight offset. He'd have me sit on the bench face in with my forehead against the bench. Uh, and that's to keep my form strict. And he'd give me a pair of dumbbells for, for flies. And I would never get more than two or three reps before he was, I failed. And he was in on the forced reps and the forced negatives. And he would beat the shit out of me on these workouts, right? From there, I remember him dragging me over. I had to do triceps, right? Chest, shoulders, and triceps for a set of dips. Cool. Okay, now I could do, back then, all right? So I'm 30, I guess, 30 years old, give or take. Uh, and I, I could jump up on a set of dip bars and knock out 20, 25 reps with no problem. By the time he'd get me to the dips, which is my fourth exercise, right? I couldn't do one dip. Like I get up on the dip bars and you're like, all right, Pete, let's go. Right. You know, get six or eight before I get in there, you know, and, and, and I go, down. <laughs> I couldn't get back up. It's like, holy cow, this guy talk about in row. Right. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm in negative digits and he's right away. We're doing four reps, and I'm like embarrassed. I'm like, this is the whole gym's watching me. And he just beat the hell out of me with these high intensity workouts. So I learned a lot. You know, I, it was, it was Lou used to fly once a year to California to actually train with Mike Menser. Uh, and he did that for, for a, a few years. And in New York, training with Lou was probably the next best thing. And in a lot of ways, I think it was better. So training with Lou is like training with Mike Menser, but I think better because he had a, you know, he, he wanted to be a personal trainer. Menser wanted to be Mr. Olympia. It was different. You know, I was getting this from a trainer's point of view um, and somebody who could walk the walk. And if you look, if you Google Lou Abato bodybuilder, uh, there is a video on, on the Internet of him competing. I don't remember the year. It's probably around the same time, 1990. Um, and you got to see the physique on this guy. I mean, holy cow. He's 100 percent natural. I can attest to this. He was totally against drugs and drug use. And he'd still compete against guys who were probably taking PEDs and he beat them. I mean, Lou is just an incredible physique. He had it all calves, legs for a natural guy and just ripped upper body and arms. So I, mm -hmm. I encourage you to check this out, but this is, 
this is how we got this started. You know, that's all on YouTube for those interested. We'll link that up in the show notes. So some good YouTube videos have been doing his posing routine and that looks great. Great guy. So we put together a private workout studio. It was him and I at first. Um, and me right away, I mean, you know, Lou will tell you this and, and Lawrence, you know me a little bit now, but like right away, my wheels start turning and I'm coming up with ideas like Lou, we got to rearrange the equipment this way. You know, we need an aisle way. We need this, um, you know, and I'm driving him nuts. Um, cause he had a vision of something else. And, uh, I'm like, no, come on. I, I can really crank out sessions this way. And I walked in the door with 40 sessions a week. Um, and that's where we started. And Lewis, he was not, he had a pretty good schedule too. We would literally sit down and, and I like, you know, have a meeting and I'm like, Lou, we need to design a schedule for two weeks on one sheet of paper. Cause we're going to do that many sessions, you know, literally try, you know, you know, computer technology back then. Well, I'll tell you exactly. We had a 486 SX computer. Look that up. I mean, it's got, it's got the memory of one app on your iPhone. Um, <laughs> and we used it for Word documents and, and. Oh, yeah. I'm, looking, I'm looking at it now. It looks wonderful. <laughs> it's unbelievable, right? It's this big and it's got, it's got nothing, no capabilities, no speed. It's 1990, 1990 computer, is it? Yeah. Uh, actually, it's a little bit later now. So, cause my, my, uh, my, my then wife was pregnant with our first child, our only child. Um, and Lou and I opened this up in 97. So Lou signed a lease and I was up there. This is 1997. My wife was probably about three, four or five months pregnant. That's how I could pinpoint the date. So 1997, um, we, we started developing it. Uh, I remember we put our first marketing campaign. I was like, you know, we, we were always sitting around discussing high intensity training, you know, Menser, Yates. Jones, you know, we had volumes. We had all of our books. Lou had every book on every Ellington Darden book there at the facility. Um, we talked about high intensity training 24 seven. If we weren't delivering a session, we were talking about it. Uh, then we started talking about a couple of trainers came in as independent contractors start working there and they were talking about super slow. And that's how we heard about that. And I was like, okay, well, that, 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 def there's definitely something there. The style of training was really interesting. And that's when Lou said, we got to go down and see this guy Hutchins, uh, and check out this certification course. Um, he's got this equipment called Menex that we've been hearing about. We want to see it's Arthur Jones, right? We want to see the Menex equipment. And, uh, I, yeah, yeah, I was, I was. You know, I'm an equipment junkie to this day. So yeah, I want to see this. You know, I, I saw a, a catalog and a photo. I think I called them up and I asked them to mail me a catalog of their equipment, right? So it's not available online. I don't think they had a website yet, right? But people weren't, you know, we weren't there. So, and this is 26 years ago. Um, I'm looking through the equipment. I'm like, oh my God, I, I got to try this stuff. This looks amazing, right? So we flew down. Now, Ken Hutchins, I'm sure all of you know here, Ken Hutchins has a whole set of rules and a certification course and blah, blah, blah. At that point, I'm knocking out more than 40 sessions a week. Our business bumped and Lou's right there with me. We're neck and neck. We're probably doing 70s and 80s at this point. Okay. So we've got our high intensity training coming down. I've narrowed it, my workouts down to four exercises. Uh, I'm really just beating people senseless with a standard Arthur John's high intensity two four protocol um, to failure. And I figure what, you know, if I can get you to failure on the first exercise, I can run you through three more. You're not going to be able to do a fifth exercise. I knew that because Lou would take me through a four exercise routine and I'm in much better shape than any of my clients. And by the fourth exercise, I couldn't even do a dip. So like, there's no reason to take it further. I, you know, I'm not going to make the weights lighter. I'm going to do this. And here's the thing. And you're all going to get upset with me. Nobody's going to get bigger and bulkier and be on the Olympia stage. Because when I was training with Lou, I was probably 220, 225. And I started losing size on my high intensity workouts. I just, I'm a volume trainer. If I want to get 19 inch arms, 
lots of sets, lots of reps. Okay. That was just me. High intensity made me stronger, but smaller. I lost my pump. Um, whatever. Anyway, I applied that to my clients, which by the way, I never got fired once from a client who said, you know, Pete, I'm getting too big. It's doctors and lawyers don't want, nobody wants to get too big. They want to get stronger. They want to benefit. They want that, the health aspect. They don't want bigger. Nobody got bigger. So I'm doing these routines. We're doing it. We go down to see Ken Hutchins. Now, little, uh, he wears a pair of shorts, sneakers, always shorts. And he had, it could be winter time, January, seven degrees out. He's in shorts, right? Fortunately, he's got the legs for it. The guy's built like a bodybuilder. He looks fantastic. Um, and a t-shirt, which at that time, instead of heavy duty, he was probably wearing one that's an ultimate training center. I think we all had t-shirts back then. I, I think I asked him for, you know, Lou, we need some really nice t-shirts to, you know, for the studio and he got them. So we're all, we're, we're in ultimate training t-shirts. He's in shorts. We walk into Ken Hutchins on a certification Friday night uh, after our flight down. And, uh, you know, he wants everybody in a suit and tie. And here we are, two guys from New York, you know, hey, Ken, what's up? What do you got? Like, we weren't there to praise him. <laughs> we were there to challenge him, you know. And I looked on his schedule. Him and all his trainers combined were not doing as many sessions a week as I was doing by myself. So I was like, teach me something. You know, we had an attitude right away. And it was a big adjustment for Ken to just deal with us. You know, these two guys from New York who thought who they were, we were, we were able to back it up. Um, we were knocking out high intensity sessions at a level at that point that I don't believe anybody else was. And you can name anybody in the industry, anybody. And I don't think they were doing the volume that we were doing. We, were, we, we figured out a marketing approach that was good. I started promoting once a week, 15 minutes once a week. We actually put postcards out. Uh, this is it. This is the way to go. You don't need twice a week. And, I, you know, we were really in your face with this. I can kick your ass in 15 minutes once a week. You all need to work out for the rest of the week. I mean, we were really aggressive about our marketing. But guess what? Client walked in, you know, we challenged people. The client walked in the door, we backed it up. Uh, let me tell you, it looked like a crime scene in the gym, right? We had this big aisle way and we had a little room, um, a little tiny room that we would either use for stretching or, you know, we had a little refrigerator in there for snacks. It was just a little tiny room in the studio where clients would have to go and lay down to recover from the workout so they could leave. Right now, picture this, which I realized at some point, this is not a good business model. We got to tweak this, but the workout would take somewhere between nine and 12 minutes. The recovery for them to be able to stand up and go back to work would take 45 minutes. So they still needed the hour now. And, I, and I'm thinking to myself, well, I don't think you can tell Lou, I'm like, look, at some point in time, you know, clients can say, I still need an hour, even though it's once a week, you know, but I got to devote and then walking to and from work, I need 90 minutes, you know, like it's not going to work out well. We got to figure out how to not, but there'd be bodies. If you walked in for your session, chances are there's somebody laying down unconscious on the floor. No joke. I mean, we would yeah. do it. That was our, that was like part of our marketing technique. Let's put these people on the ground in 15 minutes. And Lou and I, I mean, we had fun. We, we enjoyed it. Like, you know, sometimes you, I catch Lou from across the gym. They, you know, just give him that look. And he'd give me that look like, I'm going to kill my client right now. And he'd like, yeah, well, I'll kill mine worse kind of a thing. 15 minutes later, you got two clients on the floor. We're trying to judge which one's nearer to death. You know, it's the scene you want. And, and, and Lou will tell you. You know, we, we would just step over the bodies and go to the next, you, you're next, come in, let's go. It was aggressive. It was Mike Menser on steroids uh, type of a workout. It was Dorian Yates. It was blood and guts. That's what we were doing. That was high intensity for us back then until we figured out how to take it to the next level. So 
And uh, we saw the MedEx equipment at Ken Houches. He passed us for our certifications. Um, Lou, Lou was, uh, uh, you know, honorably passed because he studied and, and knew the work. I think, I think Ken passed me because he wanted me out of his place and never wanted me to come back. Uh, you know, we were all well in water. We didn't see eye to eye. I had a lot of questions uh, and I had enough success at that point to, uh, you know, ask. So I was like, well, why is this better? Well, you know, I don't believe this slow nonsense. Like, you know, I was really in his face with questions. Um, but I think he's, he just gave me the certificate and it wanted me out the door and never to return. So uh, just my opinion, I never asked, but we never spoke again. Um, but I took that, I took the MedEx information back and it was, that was like, you know, I, I saw now something different. I saw something completely different. I had an image in my head, MedEx equipment. Uh, the studio is going to look more like a doctor's office than a gym. We ultimate training center looked like a, it was a gym. It was a smaller gym, but it was a gym. Um, and I, I just had this whole vision, you know, how this is going to go. It's not going to be super slow. I, I did not believe in doing 10 seconds forward and 10 seconds back to failure. I never believed in failure that way. I thought it was too boring. So I had to tweak it. Um, and I said, you know what? The average, you're supposed to really kind of reach failure in 72 to 90 seconds, 96 seconds. I'm going to just cap it off at 90, the upper limit. And I'm going to start working with that formula. And that took me a little while and that didn't happen overnight, but I came up with my own protocols that were very, very different from super slow. And I used to market it as the opposite of super slow. Um, we don't go to failure. You know, you, we go to success, you know, and I really would just turn it up on his head and I did my own thing. And my thing just took off like wildfire. I mean, the bodies were coming in the door like I couldn't keep up. You so know, you, you left, you, you, you parted ways with Lou at this point and then started your own facility. You sort of slipped in there. We were, I'm sorry, we worked five years together. Uh, so 97 to uh, 2002, I opened up uh, my first studio privately with just Maddox equipment. No dumbbells, no barbells, no nothing, no mirrors. Uh, I didn't want, I didn't want it to look like a gym at all. I wanted it to look like actually a studio, which by the way, that's the first time I ever used the term studio. You know, we were, we had a high intensity gym previous to that. So I started calling it something different. Uh, I marketed it completely different. I dressed different. I just, you know, it, it was just a, a, a complete turnaround and, and business doubled. And I took it to the next level. And now I'm going way past hundred sessions a week. They're 15 minute workouts. Uh, they were always 15 minute workouts, but now we're, we're, I'm just not allotting the time, 30 minutes for them. I'm tightening their up, tightening the uh, schedule up. And it's so, still, I, so, so go ahead, Pete, finish that for that. But uh, you have to get there 15 minutes early so I can give you your workout on time. You know, it was just a rule. So. Feel free to kind of bring me back if we need to go through more, more history um, first, but I thought I would just jump straight to it. So at this point, you're running your own business. It's all, you know, your own model, the model that you feel is optimized for growth in a way, you know, maximizing revenue at that time. And, you know, you're known, I guess, in, in, in some of your, the marketing you do, some of the content on this podcast is like the seven, the seven figure man, the million dollar trainer, et cetera. And one of the, one of the, um, uh, questions is like, oh, that seems like, you know, prolific. How does one achieve that? Can you like walk us through the numbers, like break it down? Like how did you eclipse seven figures? How much did you do by yourself versus bringing other people on and sort of give us the details and all of that? Oh, uh, I started out at $50 an hour as a, as a, a you know, with, with just regular personal training going to clients. So $50 an hour was my rate. Um, I was really big on goal setting and writing it down on a, a legal pad. I have legal pads He's upset. Which, He's upset. at all times. Um, but I started out at $50 an hour. I, I wrote down $1,000 per week or 50,000 plus per year was my first goal. So I achieved that doing hour sessions, 20 sessions a week. Uh, next goal was, um, I think the next big goal, well, I know the next big goal was when Lou and I started working together in 97, 
I remember saying him to, to him specifically, um, wouldn't it be great if we can make $4,000 a week? And I started mapping out like, you know, rate increases. Uh, and uh, we were now charging $75 for a 15 minute workout, but we were putting 30 minute spots aside for people. But we were book solid. I mean, we really, we, we really enjoyed a cancellation because that was, you know, we get to eat or work out or patients <laughs> were like the greatest thing in the world. We got paid for it too, right? But now we're at $75 a session. We're doing, we're doing somewhere between 12 and 20 a day, giving us, you know, 80 to 100 a week. Uh, Lou and I both worked on Saturdays. Uh, we were work animals. We, it was it was about 100%. It was about booking sessions, marketing and booking. That was it. I mean, we, we just, our life revolved around that. So at $75, uh, well, if I'm doing 100 sessions uh, at $75 a pop at that time, $7,500 a week or uh, $30,000 a month, then I'm probably doing well over $300,000 and, and starting to clear $400,000 a year. Hang on, this was, this was with, with or without news, sorry. This is when you went solo, was it? Or? No, this, oh, is still, this is still with Lou. I'm done. I'm, I'm doing that. So, oh, wow. okay. so 97, 98, 99, probably before the year 2000, I'm doing well over 300 a week and probably breaking into 400 plus. Uh, sorry, is that sessions? $400,000 a year. Okay. Got it. Okay. Is it break that down again for me? Well, I'm doing okay. a, I'm not, a hundred sessions. I'm breaking it. I'm definitely doing a hundred sessions or going a little bit over, which was a, a, another one of my goals, triple digits, right? Everybody yeah. does double digits. I wanted triple digits. Uh, we're charging, I know we were charging $75 a session at the time. I was at that rate for a while. Um, yeah, that's five, five, that. six years. Yeah, um, got it. And so around 2002, I've got my own private studio. Now the studio was designed to take me to the next level. Um, it was smaller than Ultimate Training Center for a reason. I clearly could afford whatever space I wanted. I was making plenty of money, but I needed to have clients walk in and, and walk out like in a lap. Uh, and, and I needed the waiting room to be next to the workout room, which was a separate room. But when you walked in the door, I only wanted, um, I know exactly what I want. I had nine pieces of medics equipment. I did not want the whole circuit. I could easily afford the whole circuit. I wanted what I wanted because I needed to only use a few machines and have an A and a B routine. Um, so I needed eight or nine machines, right? Doing four or five each time. Uh, one machine is definitely going to overlap. But then I put them in an order. So they're, the last exercise was by the door again. You're out the door. And the next, you know, waiting room had room for like four to six people. So I wanted four to six people per hour rotating through uh, and just moving them. It had to be like a well-oiled machine. I had my schedule together. I had my protocols together. At that time, I capped off sets at 90 seconds a piece. I was doing my 390 protocol, which was well-received. I got a lot of referrals from that. But I also knew exactly how much time I was going to be in the gym and on a piece of equipment so I can calculate my next session yeah and that's the important part right and by the way we'll uh just just conscious of you mentioning quite a few things here in terms of the um what's the protocol called again the night was it called again oh uh, the, the, the original 390 was the name of the protocol 390 yeah so, so, slash thing. okay so we've we've obviously a lot of what we you've spoke about so far in this podcast we've gone into like massive depth on some of these things in isolation on other shows so we'll just make sure we link up to all the other shows in the post to this as well. Um, sorry, carry on, carry on, Pete. Well, so now I'm cranking. I, I, I wanted smaller, tighter, uh, more efficient studio, a more efficient studio so I can move bodies in and out faster. Um, literally, Lawrence, I, you know, Ultimate Training Center was a really great space. It's on the seventh floor of a, a seven story building. It was very long and narrow. The space was not very wide, but it had a, a pretty good length to it. And, you know, you got, you got the elevator that opened up to the, the, uh, the gym on one end. And 
you could have a machine that you might be using, like a chest press could be on the complete opposite end and corner. Uh, I don't remember how many feet it was, but it took how many seconds to walk from here to here. And I, I'm like, I need that. I need to, I need to narrow the gap. I need people like, it's gotta be two steps from here to here. I need people in and out faster. I need it more efficient. And I, I don't want them to feel like they're being shortchanged. So the studio design w- was really important. Well, now I'm doing uh, even higher volume. I have my max. So now it's time to start raising rates. So the next client that comes in, you know, hey, I heard about you. You're wonderful, blah, blah, blah. Is it really only 15 minutes once a week? I said, yeah, you can do twice a week if you want. But yeah, yes. But you're at 85 a session now. And you're at 95 a session now. And you, I just kept the next every 10 clients, I'm just bumping it up because I don't care if they say no. As a matter of fact, I'm hoping they say no. I get a break that way. So I'm operating from a position of strength, which is something I teach. Don't raise your rates prematurely. If you're desperate for sessions and you raise your rates, you're going to wipe out your schedule. It's not going to be good. With me, they saw my, they saw people in the waiting room. They saw me knocking, you know, sessions out. I'm just moving, moving, moving. Hi, you're, you're, you know, you're my 1215 appointment. And what's your name? Ruth, Ruth, nice to meet you. I don't even want to know your last name. I don't want to know your story. I don't want to know your health history. Um, yeah, I heard all about you people. I want, come here. Let me, let me show you one exercise. Come on in here. Come in. Here. Boom. Yeah, here's the, this is how it's going to go. Great. Um, you don't have to make the decision now. I'm pushing them out the door. Here's my rates and policies card. Uh, you, you can text. Uh, we didn't have text message, phone call. Leave me a voicemail if you want to sign up, you know? And yeah, it was checks, checks or cash at that point. We weren't even using credit cards yet. Um, it was just faster and simpler. So, and I push them out the door and I wouldn't care if I ever heard from them again, because I've got a hundred sessions plus going here. So, and the new rates and policies card at an increased rate. So you're bumping up the rate now, which in, my income's going, going up. Also at that time, I'm really realizing that I'm overwhelmed. I needed a less expensive option. So if I'm now at hundred dollars a session, I wanted a trainer to get, do $75 a session. We started, I started bringing trainers in with me and dumping bodies on them. So all my referrals that are coming in, all my marketing, it's now filling up another schedule. So I had a couple of trainers working for me. I. Before I we have, get to there, so, did you, so, what was your what maximum was your, income as a solo trainer? Over 600,000. Okay. And that was the $3,000 a day claim, right? Is that yeah. correct? Yeah. That doesn't add up. How many, uh, it's not obviously 365, is it? Oh. Uh, okay. So how many days would you work? I'm just curious now. How many days would you work a year? Always six. Always six days a week. Okay. Okay. So. so Saturdays was a, was always a, a good schedule. It wasn't, it wasn't a 20 session day, but it was, I would get an easy dozen in on a Saturday. I try to get out of there by like one or two o'clock, uh, and enjoy the weekend. So, so you're know, almost I'll making a million dollars with 313 days a year work. Six days. Yeah. That's impressive. Yeah. yeah. It, it, okay. it was, it was, that was it. I was e- eating and breathing that. 24 seven. That was just my thing. I wanted to book more, book more. Yeah. So yeah. I'm booking it now. I, now I've got some trainers that, you know, I've got these clients. Here's what I want you to do. And I would teach them. This is exactly, here's the routine. Here's the protocol. Um, I would find, uh, I found uh, one lady who was a Pilates instructor. Um, and it was great because she came in and I said, I, I need help. I've got sessions. You can make a lot of money. Um, well, no, I'm into Pilates, not that weightlifting stuff. And I'm totally against that. I said, you're probably against what you've heard about or what you've seen, but I would like to give you a workout and show you what I do. It's very different. And I would get the wow out of them. So I took a Pilates instructor, a lovely lady uh, named Stacy. And I walked her through a workout and, uh, and, and, I mean, she gave me such a list of complaints before the workout on why she didn't want to do it. And afterwards, she's like, oh, my God, sign me up. Will you be my trainer? I said, I can't be your trainer because I'm booked. But, but, you know, we could figure out how you can get your workouts in as well. And 
you know, you could still do your Pilates, but you know, I need you to do 20, 40, 50 sessions a week for me. And that was it. That was trainer number one. How did you, how did you, what was the model? Like, how did you compensate them? How did you set the, was he set the price of whatever, $75 a session with her? How did you compensate her? How did that work? Those uh, trainers got 50% of whatever they booked. So they got 37, 50. And I only booked them on, I wouldn't book them on, on 15 minute uh, time spots because that was just too intense. Right. It, there, there should only be one type A in a studio. So that was me. So Stacy's a lovely lady and she's doing hour Pilates sessions. I said, you can do this in a half hour. It's a 15, it's a 12 minute workout and you've got 30 minutes to complete it and bullshit with them and schedule them. It'll be easy. All right. But you're going to make $75 an hour pay scale. Okay. Now I, what the, the reasoning for that was the 75 was that's my old rate. So if a new client came in, I, I'm, I'm now I'm at a hundred a quarter, which is where I capped out. I didn't go higher than a hundred a quarter. I would tell a new client, uh, I'm at 125 for uh, once or twice, well, once a week. And I think I gave them 115 for twice a week, um, 15 minutes. It's very strict. 15 minutes. You got to be here early. This is how I work. There's no cancellations. There's no nonsense. You're going to get charged or you can work out with Stacy, <laughs> and it's 30, you have 30 minutes to get the job done. It's still a 15 minute workout, 12 minute workout. You got 30 minutes. It's $75 a session. And it's the same where I wrote it. I designed it. It's my protocol. So you're getting the same thing. You're not getting short change. And she's, she's pretty and lovely and a nice person. And I'm me, you know? Like it's a no brain train with her, you know? So you, when you, were you not doing sessions at 125 a session uh, at full kilt? Cause that's like $2 million in revenue for yourself. It's not, it, it, it could be, but it wasn't. It, 1.24 is really where I capped out. Um, so how did that work then? You just didn't charge a real 125 or you reduced your session count? You must have, cause you were giving sessions to trainers at that point. Is that correct? I'm giving, yeah, I'm giving sessions away. I'm, 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 I'm not doing more than a hundred a week. Yeah. So, you know, you gotta, you gotta get a trainer started. Right. So yeah. what I would do is like when Stacy, when Stacy said, I'm on board, uh, I would go to my $75 sessions and I mean, this would happen in just a couple of weeks as they come in, I'd say, listen, uh, you've been with me for a while and I really appreciate your loyalty. I've got this lovely lady over here, a young lady, right? And she, She's, she's awesome. She's going to give you the same workout for the same rate. Uh, uh, if you want to stay with me, I have to up the rate now because I'm, I'm booked. Also, I got at that point, uh, when I was doing that, my book deal was done. The 90 second fitness solution. It was already written and I don't, I don't, it wasn't out yet. It wasn't out yet, but it was already, you know, going on and the publishing deal was already signed. So again, you know, my popularity is going up. I'm already doing interviews on TV and radio and print. So, you know, there's yeah, a bug, right? I, and this is it. So I would move my 75s over to, and then after Stacy, I hire another young lady. Um, and then there was a guy that came in, two guys actually. So I had four trainers at one point um, and I'm filling up their schedule and it's, it, it's going. Today's episode is sponsored by Imagine Strength, the game changer in safe, simple, and effective high-intensity training machines. When it comes to HIT, Imagine Strength is your go-to for intelligently designed, efficient, and affordable equipment. Their team is passionate about HIT, and it shows in every piece they craft. So why are Imagine Strength the right choice? Number one, they tailor-make their equipment for HIT studios. Number two, they provide cost-effective solutions for your business. And number three, they are committed to ongoing innovation and refinement. Ready to take your hit business to the next level? Visit imaginestrength.com to discuss your needs and find the perfect gear for your studio. Join the hit revolution of Imagine Strength and transform your workout experience today. What was the max revenue with all, you know, a full, full capacity for your whole team, for the whole business? Or your well, business? Hey, I never got to 1.5. Okay. Uh, so 1.2, 1.2 ish. 
um, yep. was was the average. Uh, there were some years that were a little bit, uh, you know, off years, but it never went under a million, never went to 1.5. Because you're just obsessed with the money. Yeah. I always, really always was. focused on the money. Uh, oh, you know what? The sessions, and uh, first of all, yeah, and you have to understand, I want you to take it the wrong way. Uh, I love the business. I mean, there, there's just no greater business in the, in the world. I mean, you get to, you get to beat people senseless. You get to give them a workout and throw them out the door. You get to be yourself um, and you get paid for it. I mean, wh what else, what else would I be doing? It, no, I, I totally agree. And I, I know that a lot of people probably think it's quite crass. You know, you've got this guy, Pete, coming in. All you guys talk about is making money. And I'm like, this is what we need. I, I feel like for years, and I mean this respectfully, you know, I've spoken to obviously a lot of people in our industry, a lot of it private, where people are frankly struggling in our industry. And I'm like, you do like the most important work there is. Like the services you provide literally transform people's lives. Like, if you just have to, if you've got any idea or you, you follow the scientific literature or maybe even your own experience, just look at your own physique and health as a result of strength training, like you'll know that this is so powerful. And, you know, if you do it well, if you provide great customer service and great workouts, you should be obviously compensated accordingly. And I think it's a real travesty when people are uh, just uh, dramatically undercharging or uh, just not not earning well enough. And that's obviously the result of like a lack of investment in their, their business acumen a lot of the time, right? Um, mm. and, and hence why, you know, we do what we do, right? Is to try and help someone to pull those people up to where they should be. Um, so no, I, I, I think this is very refreshing, Pete. And I, I find it funny because I know it probably irks some people. Maybe I'll get a little kick out of that. And, <laughs> but um, I, I, just, I just think, it's, it's, yeah, I don't know. It, it just, it's just needed and there's no shame in it. Um, it, we, it'd be different if we were talking about, yeah, you sold something or I sold something, which, um, is just not good for the world or not good for people. And there's plenty of people doing that. And so I think that's why I have no qualms about it. It's because we're, you know, we're talking about something that people need and is of enormous value. So I have no issue. So I love it. I can't stand it when, as you know, I troll around in, in uh, personal training groups on Facebook and I keep a low profile, which is, by the way, I'll, I'll, I'll address them a little bit more on why I kept the low profile for years. Yeah, but, I um, I, you know, I, I put a post out there um, or I would watch somebody say, uh, I, I'm a new personal trainer. I just got certified and I can't wait to help people. And it's all about helping people. And they go down this road and I'm like, and I'll put, you do want to make a lot of money too, right? You know, I mean, I'll just bam, right? Hit that and watch all these other people jump in. It's not about the money. It's not about the money. And I'm like, you're an idiot. It's all about the money. Like I really get in their face about it. Like the, why do you think that? Yeah. Well, the, the, the helping people part is a given. If you're a doctor, right? You went, you, you, you went to college, you went to you pre-med, you went to med, med school, you did your residency at the, point in time where you're actually in private practice or getting paid, you probably have $500,000 in debt from college loans and stuff, right? Okay. Now you're a doctor. Now, the fact that you went through all that automatically means that you want to help people. You didn't clean bedpans and draw blood, not wanting to help people, but now you have to pay the debt. You've got to pay off the student loans and you want to actually put food on your table and maybe raise a family or something like that, right? Well, now you need money. So now it turns into helping people to, it's a business. So, oh, I guess I can, yeah. I can make yeah. money referring to x-rays. I can make a little money here. I can make, you know, I can make money. This is, the, this is the issue, Pete, isn't it? It's the, what I was trying to articulate is there's a stigma around making money. And maybe this is less so in the United States because obviously you guys basically shouted capitalism and celebrate success way more. In Ireland, it, it, it's particularly frowned upon. If people don't talk about money as much, um, you know, it's, it's considered somewhat rude to ask someone what they do too early in a conversation because obviously what you do is intrinsically linked to someone's income, which is fascinating because in the UK, it's, people aren't quite as reserved, I would say. A uh, slight difference in culture there. I've, I've realized because I've um, have upset a few people in conversation <laughs> and, uh, and that's only because I'm so nosy and curious, but, um, 
but yeah, I, I, but correct me if I'm wrong, even in the States and, and perhaps this global thing, it's just, there's a stigma tied to money. It's like, if you make a lot of money, then um, that's sort of inherently something wrong about that or something like that. So it's like, people are ashamed about talking about money, but it's like the wrong idea. Um, and obviously we don't go up to our clients and gloat about things like that. That's different, but among our peers, you should be, you should be celebrating that, you know? I think the other thing as well, maybe this is, I don't know whether this is a fitness phenomenon, but you see this in here all the time. And I'm sure you've seen plenty of this, which is especially from some of the, I don't know how to ask to describe it, like maybe purist people within the high intensity training community where they feel like there's, there's honestly an idea that I've heard spread around where it's like, you can't make money in this business. And I'm like, okay, what do you mean by that? And the, the, the way I understand it, and I'd love to have some of these people on the show and honestly debate this and, and understand it better. Um, is there's this idea that if you are delivering the workout perfectly, whatever that means, in this perfect way, and at scale, it doesn't really, uh, the business model doesn't really work, right? And it's like, there's always a trade-off. If you're making too much money or you're doing, charging X for sessions or your sessions are too quick or whatever it is, um, that the, the numbers don't really work out. I could be, I might be getting that slightly off, but I just get this feeling that it's, the overall premise is this, is that, if you if you do this right, then it's not actually a great business opportunity. And I just think there's so much evidence to the contrary now when you look at various businesses that that yeah we talked about on the show the what the business that you help the business that we help within the membership. Um, anyway, that's that's I don't know where I'm going with this, but <laughs> it's oh, it, it's an yeah. idea which I'm curious to think about. Yeah, you know when I started training clients in New York City. You know, there are obviously people with disposable income that can afford you, right? So, and you start learning about what do you do for a living? I, you know, I'm, I work on Wall Street. I'm a, I'm a lawyer. I do mergers and acquisitions. I do, uh, I'm a doctor. Uh, I train some well-renowned doctors that I was so honored to work with. I mean, people that did unbelievable work, likes to hard surgeries. You start to, and then, you know, in the course of conversation, Oh, we were at the restaurant Daniel the other night. Restaurant Daniel, what's that? And it's it's, it's a restaurant that you know makes beautiful French cuisine, and 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 uh, Daniel Balud is the chef. And uh, it, you know, it's, it, dinner for two could be somewhere in the eight to nine hundred dollar range. You know, holy cow! Well, you know, like you you hear these stories and and what car they're driving and their weekend house in the Hamptons, which was ten million dollars, and you're like. This sounds cool. I'd like to try some of that. And I did it. I, you know, like, this sounds cool. Like, I, I would look buy like an amazing sports car that nobody else has. I would go to these restaurants. Why? You know what? I got to the economic, I started doing it. I'm going out every two, three nights a week to these nice restaurants, spending $1,000 for dinner. Um, I bought a weekend home in New Jersey. You can even look this up. 2004, I spent over a million dollars on a weekend home. Uh, and I'm, a, and I used to brag about, I'm a personal, you know, what do you do? I'm a personal trader. I never glorified it. I never said author. I never said I'm a personal trader. And just to get the reaction out of them. Well, well so I got a billion dollar home weekend home. I still have my apartment in the city. I still have the studio, which these are all expenses. I eat in the city during the week. I could spend thousands of dollars on food. Literally. I'm not what exactly was that? Cool. most fancy car? You've owned a uh, uh, Jaguar XKR 100, only one of 25 made. I bought that new in 2002. It was an awesome car. Look that one up next to it. in My garage was the Hummer H2 brand new $70,000 for that. The Jaguar was a lot about 119,000. Um, I always had a Harley Davidson or a motor. I was always a motorcycle rider. And then I had Sorry. a custom made or get that daddy Magnum motorcycle, which I still have pictures of. Um, that sounds ridiculous. Custom, custom chopper that was over a hundred, uh, and then I kept a Volvo in the in the garage for daily commuting in. So three cars, one motorcycle, and a million dollar home for weekends. And you have a Tesla man now, aren't you? I have two Teslas. Okay, cool. Model Y and a Model S. I just recently traded in a Cadillac Escalade. Uh, I still have a motorcycle in the garage, brand new. I, you know, I, I rotate through motorcycles every two years. And obviously none of this really matters. This is just me asking you, cause I'm just curious about your car collection. Uh, but this is, this is not, 
this is not that important, but it's just to say that these are some things that like everyone has their own preferences, right? Where they want to invest their money. Like you said, kids' education, raising a family, buying a nice home. Maybe you want to buy a few fancy things, whatever. No judgment. I'm certainly not of the, I'm, I'm quite a frugal person. You know, I don't, don't really own many valuable things. It's just my, my personality. Uh, I also have, you know, my stage of life where I do have a lot of expenses. I do have two young kids that I want to save for and, um, you know, daycare can be very expensive, all these things. So yeah, it's, uh, it's just seasons of life and, and personal preference. But I'm just getting back to the, the focus. I think I wanted, that was a good little digression. I just did want to talk about just the philosophy of money, making money in business. Um, but if we get back to your business, so where, where were we? So you were talking, you, we were left off where you were basically a full kilt with four trainers and we were talking about the numbers, which all makes sense. I think some of the, I think that, that makes sense. You hear that and you're like, yeah, I can see how you can make that kind of money. What would you say to someone who says, Pete, prove it? Um, well, I don't, how do you prove it? Well, I can show you the real estate. I, I'm, but, okay. This is my office. This is 630 square feet. I, I have a dog pen and, and this is a bird cage. It's an eight foot wide, eight foot tall, four foot deep bird cage for one bird. Um, that cost me $10,000 to have built. Um, but it's the 7,500 square foot house. There are two Teslas and a motorcycle in the garage. If you saw the way I finished the rest of this house, you'd probably fall over. Uh, I've got cloud <laughs> balls. In a 20-foot ceiling great room, I have a coffered ceiling. Look that up and find out what that is. But I put crown moldings on the coffered ceiling. Look that up. Um, all right, so that's the way I'm living now. Um, this is just fun for me. I, I've always just liked these things. I remember not having these things. And, you know, it sucked. You know, it's like I was driving a car that I used to pray when I owned my first gym, South Shore Muscle and Fitness. I, I was driving a Renault Alliance. It was a French made car that was just imported to the United States. It probably had a hundred horsepower. It can go zero to 60 in three days. I mean, it was like an embarrassment of a car because it's all I, I can afford. Um, I used to pray it wouldn't break down because I had to get to the gym every day and work. I mean, I couldn't walk. It was just too many miles, right? Five miles. I couldn't get there. It, I didn't like being poor. It sucked. You know, I, I remember on the first of the month sitting down and looking at my, my bank book. I used to go and have meetings with the banker at the bank to say, do I have enough money to pay my rent, my car payment, my insurance and my electric bill and my phone bill? You know, like I would sit down and he, okay, Pete, let's see, this is what you took in in the gym. And this is what, you know, it sucked, man. It just, the poor sucked. And I just didn't want to do it anymore. So. Yeah, I'm an excessive person. I, I can't just do 40 sessions a week. I need to do 140. I can't just make $1,000 a week. I got to make $10,000 a week. For, I want to be the first trader ever to make 10000 a week. And then I want to pass that. You know, like, that's just my personality. Now, the benefit of my information and my story is you can take whatever percentage of that you want. So if you say, well, okay. I, I don't want to live in the gym like you did. You're, you're an obsessive compulsive nut. Okay. I don't want to do 140 sessions a week, but I'd like to do 50 or 60. Well, my information will definitely get you to 60. That's a joke. You know, if you're at 30 now, can I double you and get you to easily? That's not even a thought. My information is if you want to break a hundred, if you want to break seven figures, I've got that information. So taking less, less of it, well, there you go. Isn't that, you don't want to work for like, um, you ever want to, you, you want to hire a coach, right? Cause I see them out there all the time. And this is another reason that you and I partnered up Lawrence is because I see coaches out there all the time. And I would get on the phone with these guys. We can double your personal training schedule in four weeks uh, for a hundred thousand dollars. Like there's some geeky idiot who's never lifted a weight in his life, never turned a session, and he's going to make you a great trainer. And he's in ad advertising on Instagram and YouTube and wherever, right? Facebook. And, and I get on the phone with them and I play dumb. 
well, I want to be a personal trainer and I'm going to get certified. You can help me. Yeah, for $15,000, Pete. What do I get for fifty thousand? Well, you do Facebook ads, which you have to pay for, by the way. But we're going to make the funnel, and we're going to do this. And we're, what about the techniques? Well, tell your certification course and take. Holy cow! What a rip off, man! And it pissed me off. It, and I would watch these things, and I'm like, and you know what the sad part is? These guys are making money because for every hundred people that turn it down and say, "No, that looks like a scam," and I don't have fifteen thousand dollars, there's a dozen that say. Yeah, okay, I, I need to do this. I spoke to so many people in the last couple of months that have been caught out by scams like that, you know? It's horrible. So, yeah. it, and actually, you and I, Lawrence, we worked with a gentleman, yeah. I won't mention his name, who went for this and paid a ridiculous amount of money and did not get one thing, did not get one new client or one bit of information. And I went in with my one on one coaching and I turned it all around and I, I basically, I got him his money back in a sense that I got him more business. So it wiped out that debt, right? You know, it's just like, I feel good about that. We're living in the world now where anybody can email you or advertise and scam you. It's just like unbelievable. They want your social security number. They want to rip you off and they have no skills whatsoever. At least I'm giving something for your money. Yeah, it's like yeah, there's yeah. obviously validity in the ability to build, to, to do advertise successfully, yeah, to do paid ads, to build a funnel. There is, there is, you obviously you tell it, you know, that is a good skill and that would add value to your business. But then it all just slips through the cracks, right? It's, it, especially in our niche. It's like, well, if you don't understand how to deliver great workouts and great customer service, um, which, you know, I've come to learn, obviously, you know, working with you has been amazing, Pete, and getting the feedback from coaching clients is just phenomenal. Like, I just blown away, to be honest. But um, it's, you know, it's the amount of time you're spending with some of our coaching clients teaching the training protocols and really going through that stuff, which I guess I didn't expect that so much. But, you know, I've known, for, I guess, having done this show for a while now and being exposed to so many successful colleagues, it, it, the workout is everything, right? The workout is everything in one. It's, it's the custom service, it's the, it's the marketing, et cetera. It's the retention. Um, so fundamentally, I understand why you focus there. Um, obviously, come on to other stuff as well. But it's like, that's something which I don't think, you know, again, this is why we're really just, especially, you know, right now, we're really talking to prospective and existing hit business owners, because if you want to grow this type of business, then it's, it's all about the worker. Like the worker is so important and the customer service and the customer journey. And that cannot be addressed in one of those sort of funnel based solutions, because it's just not addressing that key aspect. Um, I think like. Yeah, sure. If you're selling maybe online programs, you've got a different business model entirely. That's not what we're talking about. Um, it, it could it could work, perhaps. I don't know. I've really thought that through. But even if you're doing virtual training, now we've got a lot of people that do virtual training aspect for their business. If yeah. you need to that to deliver the workout, right? And obviously, you work with coaching clients on the, the virtual aspect as well. Um, yeah. So, yeah, it's just it's funny recording this podcast because obviously, in preparation, we just had someone renew with you the six one-on-one. So they've gone through six, a six session one-on-one program with their team. They absolutely loved it. They're so enamored by the experience that they immediately renewed. And I was like, that's just, you know, like, what a great, what a great testimonial that is alone. And, um, cause it's, you know, obviously it's, uh, it's, it's, it's a, it's a large investment. Um, and you know, it's just funny. It was, it, the timing was quite interesting. You know, we're just about to jump on. Oh, hey, yeah, just, yeah, okay. Do we really have to talk about this? Why, why P is legit. But uh, anyway, no, it's, and, and obviously for those that are curious, we're building up more and more testimonials. Uh, and I don't want to make this, I know this sounds, this is a very salesy podcast. Let's not get away from that. I mean, it is. Um, and, and, but if you do want to let us, I guess, see what testimonials we've built up over time, you can always just go to the sales page at highintensivebusiness.com forward slash coaching and just see what we're building up there in terms of all the uh, testimonial videos and uh, and quotes from people that have just had a great experience with you. You know, I'd even better, yeah, get on the phone with me. I love doing it. And Lawrence, you know, I'm, I'm always willing to get on the phone with somebody free of charge. And let's find out if there's something I know that you don't. Uh, and it's not a competition. I love figuring this kind of stuff out. I mean, you'd be surprised. And I was on the phone uh, with a 25 year veteran trainer who's very successful, who was, you know, just the yeah, business needs to be better because of COVID, you know, we got to get it back on track. And we had to identify 
things that he just didn't know at, uh, you know, from his previous success. Sometimes people get success because of the momentum in the market and they don't really, they got there. And now that the market has been beat up, they, they're not sure exactly how to get it back on track. That, that's my job. I can tell you how to do that. But get on the phone with me free of charge. Challenge me. Get in my face. I'm not shying away from it. Right. So, P, I'm going to be nasty again now, all right? Because I'm being too nice. Step up. Let's see what else we've got here. So, let me see here. Um, da, 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 da. Yeah, well, what about... I love this. This is a good topic to talk about. Um I know it's probably going to be a longer podcast than we uh, than we expected, but that's always the way, right? The, um, so one of the one of the uh, challenges we got is where did Pete come from? You know, like you just popped out of nowhere. And when people do a Google search, you it's not that much. I mean, well, depends. I've found quite a lot of you, but then I'm a bit of a stalker, and um, I've seen all your stuff on YouTube, all the stuff you did with the the publishers when you promoted the various training programs uh, and the books. Um, and doing like training demonstrations, stuff like that. There's some interviews, uh, there's various bits and pieces, but it's not, it's not as, I suppose it is still, you still have to do some digging to find out about you. And obviously I've been running this show since I think it was like 2014, I want to say. So like 10 years now, basically. Um, and all that time I hadn't heard of you, right? And then that hence why, you know, when you reached out, I was like, this guy sounds really interesting. And then, you know, spoke to trusted colleagues and got amazing feedback. Uh, but tell us why that is. Why is it that we hadn't heard of you and, and why does it feel like you popped out that way? I spent a lot of money uh, doing that. And I learned this from one of my clients. So um, the, the, the original lesson was uh, I have a, I had a billionaire client, literal billionaire client, who you've seen movies about. And I won't go any further than that, but there's legit. Yeah, tell, me after, tell me after the podcast, right? Yeah, I will. I will tell you after the podcast. <laughs> So this client sat me down one day and, uh, you know, sometimes when a client comes in and you hear, you hear stories like, you know, this guy's coming in or he owns, he owns a $50 million mansion in the Hamptons. And you're like, "Uh, I want to look that up. You try to look it up and you find nothing. Right. And I even try to look up his job title or any, and I can't find anything on this guy. Like you can't, you put his name in, nothing comes up, nothing on Google. Right. And I, one day I asked him about it. I'm like, listen, you know, I was being nosy and I heard about your house, which consequently he was telling me about, hey, Pete, I'm building this $50 million house. You know, he got comfortable with me sharing some stories. I said, you know, I, I looked you up. I didn't find anything. He goes, yeah, I paid good money for that. I'm like, what do you mean? You get to a certain level. Do you really want somebody saying, oh, there's a billionaire. Let's kidnap his kids. All right. Wow. Bam, that hit me like right upside the head. He goes, and I can go on from there. I'm like, no need. I get it. I get it. He goes, you get to a certain level of success. And if it matters to somebody else, you better like, get a, you know, take a low profile. So I did. I actually had a web person, uh, I call them web persons, what uh, internet, uh, somebody who was doing web design for me, who I was working with and paying for 10 years to build my my uh, websites and uh, helped me with my social media. I had a publicist, Simon and Schuster assigned a publicist to me, all right, which probably cost $10,000 a month because I checked the rate. Um, I had an agent. I had, at one point, if you put Pete Cirque in a Google, you got 220 billion hits and it was mostly me. 220, I remember getting on the phone with my mother and I say, mom, Google my name. And she wrote it and she goes, Wow, this is like over 200,000 hits. I'm like, no, 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 count all the zeros. Oh my God, it's over 2 million. And then I'll count it again. 220 million. I'm like, yeah, that's all me. She goes, oh my God, right? And then when I talked to this client, he's like, you got to be careful with this at some point. At some point, this could come and bite you in the ass. So I did. I got my web person and I said, see how much you could take off because the Googling my name doesn't make me any money. Word of mouth makes me a fortune. More than books, more than anything, more than speaking. I get, I was getting $10,000 for a speaking engagement, right? Through the publisher. Through any of this stuff, word of mouth at my sessions were my bread and butter. I didn't need a Google search. I didn't need an ad. I was in Self Magazine. As a matter of fact, my workout was on the cover of Self Magazine. 
I was in Oprah's magazine multiple times. She broke Amazon for me when she did a review of my book and gave me rave reviews. Um, I was on the front page of the New York Times. I got all this stuff. You want to say prove it, Pete? I got all of it. My mother framed everything. I got it all in flames. I did over 5,000 interviews on radio, TV, and print. I, I got to the point where when they would call me up in the morning at five o'clock in the morning and say, you're on with this, this, and this today, I would be miserable. Okay. That's it's like, it's like, now it's like work. And I, I really don't want to talk about the same thing again for the 5,000th time. It's, you know, crazy. Well, I started systematically taking my name down. Another thing is my books. Um, I try to steer them away from like, they, they don't put it. I, I would never put like Mike Mentor, Dorian Yates, or Arthur Jones in my, you know, ad words. Uh, I disassociated from that. And yes, it was about high intensity training, but I was trying to appeal to a different market. So you guys wouldn't know who I am because I didn't associate my books with Arthur Jones and Mike Mentor. That makes so sense, in the, yeah. it wouldn't pop up. You know, I, I would went a different route. I was trying to get away from that. On top of that, I didn't want anybody, because I got ripped off once, two, three, four, five times, where a trader would come in, they'd see the dollars, they'd let me fill their schedule up, and then they'd walk out the door with the clients. So at some point, I had to come up with a system where that wouldn't happen anymore, all right? And, you know... You're doing 140, well, more. So let's say the studio is now doing 300 sessions a week, right? And somebody walks out the door with 60 of those sessions and you're down to 240. 240 is a lot of money, but it's not what I'm used to. I've got to now rebuild that back up, but I've got to rebuild it in a way where I don't get ripped off again. That was a challenge. And that would happen periodically, right? So, you know, Peter, are you making $2 million a year? No, you know, like this year, somebody took, $500,000 worth of business from me and I got to build it back up. And it would take me six to nine months or a year. It doesn't happen in a week, right? And, and now you got a competitor that you have to put off at the knees and go against. It's, it's a pain in the ass. So keeping a low profile was important to me at some point. I, my, my business model was I want to make more money, but I don't need people walking in the door saying, oh, I heard about your money. I, you know, I want it. So I had to push them aside and that was a challenge. It cost me a lot of money to get a low profile. Now, if you Google search me, you don't come up with very much and that's on purpose. So that was where you had this, this web guy do some SEO, uh, wizardry to, yep. uh, to help kind of delist you basically, or, or, or no, no index, a lot of your content, perhaps that kind of, oh, yeah. not that we have to get into specifics. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I sat him down. I said, yeah, I, I'll give you a monthly fee. Tell me how much money you want. He gave me a, a monthly fee, which was not a small amount of money. I was paying his mortgage and car payment for a couple of years. And, and he said, this is going to take a couple of years. It's not going to happen like in a week. Okay. I no, I understand that. And I said, but every, every month when I send you a check, right, when I transfer money to you, if I Google search my name, my number should be coming down. Right. He said, yes. Okay, so now, so obviously things have changed quite a bit. Now you're on the biggest podcast on the internet. No, um, but now you're uh, on a on a modestly sized uh, media channel r rather regularly, um, and you know you've got social media accounts, etc. So now you're almost going in the other direction, albeit in a focused way. How do you feel about that? Do you get worried I'm about not. security and competition, etc.? I had 5,000 friends and then a lot of followers on my Facebook page. I'm down to 2,000. Um, it's a focused group. So your, your podcast is a focused audience. It's high intensity business. That's a very niche market. I'm, I'm speaking to a very specific audience who I'm very fond of, right? I'm, I'm very fond of this business. I have no problem talking to fellow trainers and business owners, Yeah, you know, yeah. plus I'm not turning any sessions anymore. So I have no problem sharing my information because you can't steal anything from me. Which you're, which you're a little bit sad about, aren't you? I you know why it's nostalgic. I think about training. I think about it every day. I think about, I'm still, I shop for equipment every day. Like imagine strength. Like, you know, when Jeff 
launched his line, I was like, oh my God, this is great. You know, I, I still think about medics equipment. Like, you know, it's, it's, it's like a, a drug. Uh, and I'm trying to, you know, okay, that was then. It's different now. But I like talking about it. I like sharing it. If you can't steal anything from me, I'll, I'll tell you anything you want to know. So I, I like doing that. And it keeps me in the game um, in a way that, uh, yeah, I don't have to worry about the day-to-day -day stuff. Which is, by the way, I, I, I turned over 150,000 sessions in my career. Uh, and, and doing 140 sessions maximum in a week. Okay. Even, even if it's just a hundred, just a hundred. I want you to try that sometime and then see how you feel on Sunday. It's tough on the body. I mean, it beats the hell out of you. And my health was starting to suffer at some point. My wife sat me down and said, look, you're not going to make it to 60 years old. You're going to die before you retire. So you may want to rethink this. So we had to rethink this and, and have an exit plan. But but I, I like it. I miss it. I want to do it. You know, yeah, so, I yeah. so, okay. So this is answer the question there in a way, which is, you know, why did you stop doing it? The sheer, sheer volume and the toll it was taking. Um, why not? Why didn't you consider just reducing your workload significantly and having all other trainers take on those sessions and just keep running things? Uh, a couple of reasons. So one, it's not in my personality. Like, you know, it's, it's for me to do less than a hundred sessions in a week. I feel like a loser. Um, yeah. now it's, I know it's pathetic, right? You're very really offended. Just, like everyone's like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know. Um, but that's just me. Like uh, I'm competing with myself at all times. I want to be number one. I want to be, and then there's a certain amount of money, like at the end of the week on Saturday afternoon, when I'm tallying up my schedule for the week and I see what I made, like, you know, it made me feel great. I feel very accomplished. It was a great number. It was a little better than last week. It was not as much, you know, that was my thing. And to do half of that is like, it's just such a letdown. Just, you, I'd rather just not do it. So I had to replace the income. Plus I had saved up money and, and made some wise investments. I had great clients who were giving me really great tips along the way. Hey, Pete, you're making some pretty good money now. Why don't you put some here? Yeah, yeah, okay, great idea. You know, and I did. Um, it, 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 it made me comfortable. It made me, it put me in a position where I could just walk away when I was ready to walk away. So, and it was my wife, my wife really opened my eyes to that. You physically can't do it forever. Yeah, the more I learn about your relationship with your wife, she sounds like a great influence to me, to be fair. And, um, Obviously, you um, you built a backup plan, right? So you basically built a seven-figure nutrition business in the background, um, which was a great idea in terms of helping you to transition and not really hurt your level of income too much. Um, and perhaps we can talk about that for another day because um, you know we're we, we're getting to the end of this podcast today. But I think one of the big questions that I had for you, and I'm sure a lot of people have, is uh, you know what what happened? Like, because you didn't sell the business. You gave it away. And I thought that was, I thought that was either incredibly naive or uh, very gracious or silly. You so know what? Tell us about that. The, the business served me very, very well. It put me in a financial position that I was set for life. Um, and I didn't need it anymore. Uh, my body was hurting. I started having aches and pains that were, were, were concerning. I, I was having low back pain. Uh, I was having leg, leg and knee pain. Now, it was just, my body was just breaking down. I was drinking uh, coffee all day long. And I like my coffee light and sweet. So there's milk and sugar in it. And even though I'm a low carb guy, here I am, you know, like it's <clears throat> one cup gets you going in the morning. <clears throat> Excuse me. But after a while, you need two cups because you get immune to it. Well, I'm drinking like four or five cups a day with milk and sugar in it. It's just beating my body. You know, I feel horrible now. I actually ate. Um, and so we, we, we had this exit plan. So it, and when we sat down and, and my wife said, look, look, here, you got enough money. You don't need it anymore. Stop this. Because I like on Sunday, I'd be like crippled. And she'd have to kind of get me like propped up for Monday morning, which I wanted to do. So when we, we sat down and said, okay, this is it. And we actually, and she said, 
She said, okay, well, give me a date, 30 days from now. You know, 30 days from now, I'm done, which was the day before Thanksgiving 2016, Wednesday. Wednesday before Thanksgiving 2016. I sold my Menex equipment uh, for dirt cheap. I mean, if I told you what I sold it for, you scream in, in, at, the, at, the, at the video right now. It's like, I could have bought 10 lines for that. But yeah, I just... I just needed it out. I didn't need to make money on it. I didn't need my money back on it. I just needed somebody to come and get it. Then I gave all the clients to two trainers and one other person who you know, but two trainers who were loyal to me and, and were really excellent trainers. And I gave them a fortune. I remember the one trainer telling me, um, I, I gave, gave it to him for free. And I set them up with Lou Abada because Lou takes private contractors in his facility. So I said, look, you could pay this guy rent. I know this guy for a lot of years. He's a great guy. Um, he's got Menex equipment. He's got everything else too, but he's got Menex equipment so you can keep your routines going. Um, you get all the clients for free. I will not take, I don't want a penny. You can't offer me money. And I will set you up and you'll be great. Uh, I think they were paying him $2,500 a month in rent to be a private contractor. And I remember the one trainer calling me up four days into their week, their first week saying, I made about $13,000 so far. And, and freaking out because he'd never seen that much money kind of come in in that short a period of time. You know, as we were transitioning him over, I'm like, this is good. You'll be fine. Some, uh, listen, Lawrence, this is a real thing. Some people are afraid of success and mm -hmm. really need to be touched through it. And they set up their own roadblock. Like, you know, when that kind of money comes in, it freaks them out. So, you know, I helped these guys. It was a, a gentleman and a, and a lady. Uh, and they did very, very, very well. I did not take a penny. Lou Abato, I sent clients his way. I was like, I would tell him, like, look, this is an old friend. I know this guy. We worked shoulder to shoulder for five years straight. He, he's an excellent trainer, and he is. Um, you'll be in great hands. So I divided them up between those three people, uh, 99%. And then a few other clients I sent, sent to some other friends who were kind of struggling and need a little lift. And that's it. I walked away. Just like that. So, it's the penny. so I get that. But um, it's, uh, when the way you described it to me before is it didn't feel like it made sense for you to sell it because you didn't feel like you'd get enough for it, um, which made it, it didn't feel worthwhile and it was like well that's not really worth the stress and the time and the resource to do that when i could just be there's opportunity cost there i could just be focusing on my other business or doing other stuff um firstly is that accurate and secondly do you feel like there was a when looking back you could have made that business more valuable and therefore a far more you know a, a much more attractive um purchase and made a lot of money that way I, uh, one of my clients, a guy named Bob, who is in the, um, the financial business, uh, that's also like a wall street kind of a guy. Uh, I, one time he sat me down and said, he said, you know, you can never sell this business. And I said, why? He said, because it's you. He said, everybody came in the door because of you, they, you got the book deal because of you, you get the interviews because of you, because you, you are the business. You could be doing, you could be selling paper clips and people will buy your paper clips because it's you. So it's not the workout. And I, I took that to heart. I, it was a compliment. I know what he meant. Um, he said, you can, you can switch this and you can make it not about you because, but I know you're a type A addicted personal trainer that likes doing this, but you, could you be like a Luke Carlson? Yeah. He, he told me that, you know, without mentioning Luke's name, he didn't know, we didn't know who Luke was back then. But could you be like a, a guy who's running a franchise? Yeah, I could. I just didn't want to go that way. I, I like being in it. I like being mm -hmm. hands. Um, so it, it, Luke is pretty handsy though. He still does the training. Oh, uh, no, not as much, obviously. I'm not taking anything away from, from, from probably one of the most gifted people I know in the industry who I admire. Okay. Very and strange. I don't say that about a lot of people. I mean, this guy, and I use him, he's a reference. Uh, you should dress like Luke. You should look like Luke. You should, you should be in a set like Luke. I use, I use him all the time because people can't see me doing it. Um, but yeah, it, it's, it's, uh, 
I just didn't feel, I didn't feel right about it. And I really enjoyed giving it to friends. Um, it served me well. I made my money. So what am I going to make? Another couple hundred thousand dollars? Uh, it, you know what, Lawrence? For me to be able to say that that's insignificant and I didn't need it meant I succeeded. So I felt good about giving it away. And I still do. There's no, there's do you not think, I know, I, I, I love that you did that. And I think that's, that's amazing. And that you helped those people become successful. I think that's a big part of business and a big part of life. Um, paying it forward, as they say. Uh, but do you not sometimes think, hmm, if I had built the brand and hadn't built it around me, which I don't know, sometimes it depends on what your goals are, right? Like I know a lot of people that have actually, you know, there's a, there's a very popular book called Built to Sell and a lot of people build businesses to sell and they, they use that as a filter for decisions, et cetera. But I actually know a lot of people that are going the other direction now. It's quite interesting. Like this, obviously there's a big popularization of personal brands. And, you know, if you're an influencer, for example, um, it's it's far easier to grow that and and uh, and make money because um, people obviously trust human beings more than like you know entities if that makes sense. Um, so and so that's interesting. But that being said, did you do you ever look back at that time and think, hmm, if I hadn't built it around me and I had and I know I don't know, let's say back in those days it wasn't that long ago. But obviously, there's another problem with selling packages versus subscriptions. If you've got a subscription business, it's inherently far more valuable because packages expire um, and subscriptions just they tend to have they're far more sticky and that kind of thing and have far more, uh, more lifetime value, right? Um, do, you, do you sometimes think if you build it in that way, uh, uh, you would have sold it for a, you know, a, a significant number at that, at that stage, at that point? Uh, first of all, I disagree. I think subscriptions are uh, holding you back in your business. And I think packages the way I have them. <laughs> so, uh, excuse me for losing my voice. <clears throat> but uh, I think packages, if done the right way, make you a lot more money. Uh, and there's a reason for that. And I teach that. And, I'm, and I stand firm on that. The only model that I ever entertained in my career was the Keezer model. And uh, anybody who's watching this podcast knows who Keezer is, Warner Keezer. And his amazing facilities and his Menex equipment, which is his, his version of it. I, I, it. It's a gym model with a protocol in place and rules. And I, I did entertain that. And then I thought about, um, you know, I'm, I'm just the kind of guy that like, I have to be in every location. Kind of, you know, like I would want to be there. Um, so I could, I could at best build seven locations so I could spend one day at each. Um, I just had limited vision for that next level. And that's not, that's why I'm not an eight figure guy. I'm a seven figure personal trainer, which is I probably succeeded or, or I'm one of the best at what I did, but I am zero and, and, and not even in the ball game at the next level. <clears throat> so when you look at eight figure people, which is somebody like Luke Carlson doing eight figures, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and stuff like that. I'm not, I'm not even in his ballpark. You know, I'm, I'm not even in the stadium. I didn't buy a seat. <clears throat> um, this is an interesting point that I wanted to make is, um, you and I have some conflict. There's things we disagree about. Um, and, and, and that's okay. You know, like there's more than one way to grow a business. Bother me. And like, I, it's, no, it's just quite interesting because I've, I've spoken to people in the past and, you know, we will have this experience. I've had guests on the podcast where they're like, oh yeah, I love that goal. We agree on everything. I'm like, that's not a good thing. That's not necessarily a good thing. Like, obviously you, you want to be around people that have similar values to et cetera, but it's actually more productive to be around people that have diverse views on things. Um, and, and businesses like that, sure, there are principles in business, but there's a lot of flexibility too. Um, even now, I, I probably don't 100% agree with you on the membership side of things. And although you have described it in more detail with me separately, and I get there's nuances to this, and I did like the way you described it to me last time we spoke. So you know, won't, won't elaborate here, but if people want to obviously reach out to you, they can learn all about the way you do things, which is which is good. Um, but yeah, I think that's an important thing to say. Uh, you know, so I've had people email me saying, it sounds like you, know, you have to real peep back in sometimes on a podcast or you disagree on something. I'm like, yeah, but like, that's not necessarily a bad thing. You know, it's, uh, it's different ways of doing things. Um, let me see. So Pete, I'm, I'm just aware of time and I feel like 
I'm just, I feel like I've, I've been quite good in terms of challenging you. <laughs> Oops. Um, and I guess I just wanted to take a moment to just answer another question. I should have said this at the start, so hopefully people are still tuned in. Um, and that's just people ask me about why don't you talk about Optima Strength very much? And I do intend to record a longer podcast soon about, about the studio. Um, there, there, there's two main reasons for that. Um, one reason was when we first started the studio, I actually didn't want to leverage high intensity business as like an unfair advantage, which sounds ridiculous. And trust me, it, it was hard not to do that. Even though, even though the target market didn't really listen to the podcast, it would still help in terms of generating a few leads, virtual training, that kind of thing. We do a lot of virtual training and optimal more than probably many other people listening. And so there was that. So I didn't want to run a promote out the gate. I, I, my intention was to talk about it more later on. So I could say, hey, we got to hear without it. And, you know, I mean, I know I could have done something like all these clients here came from high intensity business. So I won't include them in our numbers that we report, but I could have done that, I guess. Um, and then something else happened. I actually, and I really want to be public about this. And I've, I've been, I've been um, very transparent about this in the membership, but I think it's important to, to say on the podcast, I don't think I have yet, is I found it very difficult to do multiple things. Some people can do it. I have, I have two young children, a two and a four-year-old. Bearing in mind, they're even younger at the stage I'm talking about now. Um, I have high-intensity business, the online business, the podcast, the service that we provide, the website, et cetera. Uh, all the responsibilities uh, involved in that. And then I was essentially general manager of Optima Strength. So I was running, I was doing sessions. I was managing the team, running weekly meetings, keeping people accountable, uh, helping with decisions about strategy and buying equipment and um, market sales and marketing. That's a big component. And I just couldn't do it. I actually noticed that my, because I was so unfocused and I was trying to be a good father and a good partner and I, I've always been very passionate about, you know, not letting that slip and making sure I'm, you know, I'm, I'm doing the best I can in terms of that side of things. Um, and I would just notice that things would just suffer. Like I'd have more conflict with my spouse and I'd be more, you know, shouting at my kids and that kind of thing. And high dizzy business would, would suffer. And I just, one day I just sort of have a, I don't know what else to say, but like a come to Jesus moment <laughs> um, where I was kind of like, I don't mean to offend anyone who's religious, by the way, when I say that, um, is, is I just realized like, I had to focus, I had to compromise. Um, and so high intensity business is my baby. And so I, you know, I sat down with my very understandable business partner, Sean, who I'm very fond of, and it's one of my closest friends. And I intend to do business with Sean for the rest of my life. And, and, and I'm excited to what the future holds, because I think there's so much more we can do together. He's been a wonderful sort of mentor and influence on me. Uh, and. Hopefully you'll hear this, uh, listen to this and hear that. And, uh, you know, I said to him, look, I've got to, I've got to reduce my role here. I still really want to help this business, but I've got to compromise. And so anyway, long story short, I, cause I said, I will do a separate podcast on this, but I now just help Optima Strength with the sales and marketing. Um, and you know, we're doing pretty well. It, it, it means that I can, I can experiment a lot with what I do there. So I can test things out and then I can report back in the membership. Um, and on the public podcast about what we're doing, what's working, what's not working, which has been really fun. And obviously it's been very beneficial to people, right? If I do something and I say, this is exactly how I did it, that helps people generate the results they want. And I have a strength in sales and marketing anyway. So it makes sense for me to focus there as that's the gift that I can give up to Matt. So let's give people some numbers. We're probably doing in the region of 60 sessions a week at the moment. I suspect come the way the trajectory our growth's going at the moment, we'll be at probably a hundred plus sessions in the new year. And sort of like probably by the, maybe the second quarter, I suspect, which is great. Um, so, you know, if anyone's questioning whether I'm a successful hit business owner or I've been successful at helping a hit business, I mean, you can argue I have, not including the hundreds of hit business owners that we've helped with our services over the years as well. Um, and uh, one teaser I will give, which I do intend to expand on in future podcasts, is the things that we've really done to, to grow the business and grow sessions. And we, we are growing the clientele quite well month to month. It's really simple, Pete. It's, uh, it's uh, bark.com, which is effectively warm reach out. So it's like, you know, a platform marketplace where people post interest in personal training, and then you reach out to them and you follow them up. And it's just a case of um, simple, not easy, right? Doing lots of reach outs doing a lot of volume, uh, maybe a hundred a week, um, probably slightly less than that actually. 
and uh, and generating those free workouts. It's a numbers game, right? And we've just been utilizing that and being focused with that. And sometimes I, I listen to a lot of our colleagues in this space. And I think, how, when was the last time we just reach out to someone and offer them a free workout? <laughs> yeah, you're hiding around, hiding behind content or a website and SEO and like, just reach out to people. Anyway, that's one for another day. Um, but I wanted to give people an update on Optimus. So I still work closely with Optimus Strength. Um, and I still help with sales and marketing. That's my responsibility there. And I also manage a guy who helps with, um, uh, helps with the sort of free workout side of things, the consultations. Um, but then they, and that enables me to then spend the rest of my time on high intensity business. Um, so anyway, going forward, I will obviously be talking about Optimus Strength more um, in terms of what we're doing. And that's obviously going to help that business too, probably, which is great. Um, but yeah, that's what I'm doing on that. Sorry, Pete, I didn't mean to just completely sabotage our podcast to talk about that, but I just wanted to, whilst we're asking if you're legit, I thought we'd also question whether I'm legit as well, even though I did that myself, which is a bit unfair. <laughs> yeah, it's good stuff. We need to know. We need to know, and I'm glad you shared it. Yeah, and I will be sharing more as well. And um, Pete, any sort of uh, final thoughts before I wrap this one up about, you know, the question of is Pete legit? How can we trust Pete? This type of thing. Uh, you know what, you made a point with, with, uh, talking about Optima on, and you, you're kind of making a point for me. So, um, why I didn't go to the next level and have multiple locations and, and develop a method and, and, and stuff like that is really because I focused on what I was good at, what I knew I'd be good at, what I could build on, what I could take to the ultimate level. And I just wanted to, I just wanted to do that until I couldn't do it anymore. And now I just want to teach it. I want to share it. I just want to, uh, just, you know, Hey, what do you want to know? You want to go from 20 to 40 sessions a week? Let's do it. It's easy. So it, that, that, that's where I'm at. And I, and I, I appreciate this platform and, and the ability to do it. So it means a lot to me. All right. Very well. welcome. I appreciate you providing so much value that you do to the, to the audience. And then, yeah, I mean, look, I just, I just want to make sure I've been clear on how I described lots of my strength. It's got nothing to do with the business or anything like that deliver a high quality, high intensity training for a workout experience. It just came down for me to focus. I think you, 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 learn, listen, you, know, you learn about these people that can do multiple things at once. Maybe there are some people out there that can do that effectively. I think they're few and far. I think the majority of us need to focus, frankly. Like I've got, we've all got those friends who are trying to do free business at the same time and never actually achieve anything, right? Um, and whenever someone says to me, oh, I'm doing this, but I'm also doing this sort of thing on the side, I'm like, that's probably, that's just, just, you're just distracted, right? Um, and it's like, there's this fallacy, isn't it? It's like, um, if you're focused on doing a lot of things, there's this, the, the idea that, oh, if I do three or four things, we'll just see which one gets traction and then go, focus on that one. But it's like, no, 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 you need to focus on one to actually get the traction in the first place, <laughs> right? Yeah. And I'm very, I mean, I'm probably so, so tuned into my own, you know, self-aware of my own strengths and weaknesses that I know for me, if I focus on one thing or view of things, I can be way, I'm very good at that. And, you know, I, I feel confident in my abilities when I'm very focused. You spread me thin, I'm, I'm, I'm awful. Like I'm, sh I'm shocking. I'm not productive in that way. It's just, I'm too pedantic. I have too much attention to detail. I have to like, yeah, I can't hold all these plates in the air. I'm just not, I don't operate well that way. So anyway, anyway. But uh, yeah, so I want to get up my chest. I feel uh, maybe hopefully that's been interesting and insightful for people who are curious. Um, but Pete, thank you so much again. Uh, people can find you on Facebook, Pete Serqua, C-E-R-Q-U-A. If they want to learn about uh, your services, obviously the partnership we have, they can learn about your coaching over at highintensitybusiness.com forward slash coaching. Um, and again, there's just heaps of testimonials and we've got some videos now, plenty of videos in fact. Um, for you to peruse if you still need more validation, Pete's skill set. Um, and obviously, if you want to listen to the other podcasts we've done, we've done a lot, you can just go to highintensitybusiness.com, search episode 450, get all the show notes. And until next time, thank you very much for listening. This episode is brought to you by Imagine Strength, your go to for safe, simple, and effective high intensity training equipment. Growing a successful high intensity training business requires workout equipment that's not only high quality, but also intelligently designed to fit the unique needs of your studio. And that's where Imagine Strength comes in. Drawing on the wisdom of the legendary Arthur Jones, Imagine Strength has crafted a groundbreaking line of fitness equipment that's as affordable as it is efficient, giving your studio the upgrade it needs without breaking the bank. 
The team at Imagine Strength breathes hit. Their passion for high intensity training shines through in their designs, which they've consistently refined and innovated for optimum effectiveness and user experience. From my personal experience at REC, I can attest to the careful consideration and craftsmanship that goes into every single piece. My Imagine Strength workout was absolutely brutal, in a good way, of course. Now, what makes Imagine Strength truly stand out? They have innovative equipment tailored for the unique needs of HIT Studios, affordable and efficient designs, lowering the barriers to entry for a HIT business, continuous innovation and refinement, ensuring your studio stays ahead of the curve. Founder Jeff Turner and his team are dedicated to moving the HIT industry forward and making strength training accessible to more people than ever before. Here's how you get started. Number one, visit imaginestrength.com. Number two, discuss your specific needs with the team. And number three, select the equipment that will propel your business to the next level. Head to imaginestrength.com today and give your HIT business the Imagine Strength edge. Be part of the HIT revolution and see firsthand how their unique equipment can transform your studio's workout experience. Elevate your HIT business with Imagine Strength. Let's go. Let's go.